by speaker from University of Georgia, USA. We have uh, an opportunity to learn from the expert hydrogeology and remote sensing on Georgia, USA. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, spatial, spatial and remote sensing analysis in special case for hydrogeology is very important in water resources development. Therefore, it is important that spatial and remote, uh, remote sensing analysis in hydrogeology need to be understood in groundwater sustainable development. I hope that through this program, we will get depth knowledge on how to develop groundwater sustainable development and water resources management. To our students, I really wish that you will get interesting knowledge. So you will take a huge benefit on attending this lecture. Finally, I would like to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation to Professor Adam Miles Milski to their valuable input to this program. I would also like to extend a special thanks to the committee for their support to organize this program successfully. I hope this program will serve to broaden your perspective on groundwater sustainable development and water resources management. We also hope that in addition to this guest lectures, we can establish cooperation in other programs. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Usi Andawayanti. Now, ladies and gentlemen, according to our schedule, we are going to continue to uh, let the presentation and discussion from Professor Adam uh, that will be get by our moderator today is Jet Van Sitki Fidari. Time is yours. So please. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rahma. Uh, let uh, <coughs> Professor Adam, let me become a uh, moderator uh, today. And for student, I will uh, give a short introduce uh, for Professor Adam, because this is uh, the beginning of the program. Uh, Professor Adam uh, Miloski obtained PhD from Western Michigan University in hydrogeology, speciali specializing in remote sensing and hydrologic modeling. Uh, he now already professor, and I will not hold any longer. Professor Adam, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Jed Fan, and, and everyone for this one wonderful introduction and this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about my research and, and my thoughts and, and um, you know experience on on this very important topic, right? On, on groundwater resources and development. I think it's a global issue. Uh, and one that we really have to come together, not from just a scientific standpoint, but a society standpoint, a government standpoint. And, and I, I think that's what you're going to see a little bit of today. Um, I also want to say that, you know, if at any time anyone wants to inter in interrupt me, feel free or put it in the chat. Um, that's OK with me. Um, you know, I know Jetfen is moderating. You know, they might have a slightly different style, but I'm OK with it. Uh, also, you know, I think today is going to be a little bit more of a, a primer, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm going to introduce some principles and fundamentals of remote sensing uh, overall and, and some for water resource management. And tomorrow I will be doing this part two, which will be a lot more specific examples. Um, and, and again, you know, tailored a little bit more, be more to your questions. Um, so without further ado, what I will do is share my screen now. Um, and I've entitled this one, Principles and Fundamentals of Remote Sensing and Hydrologic Science. Um, I know I, I had this introduction, so I'll go through it quickly. I, I received my bachelor's um, looking at geospatial landscape analysis. Then I worked uh, at a national laboratory in the United States at Argonne. Uh, and then I received my PhD in hydrogeology and hydrologic modeling. 
Uh, and then I postdoc for three years doing um, hydrogeophysics, isotope geochemistry, and so forth. Uh, and then I've been fortunate to have went from assistant to associate and now most recently full professor here at the University of Georgia. Um, I've been funded and worked on research um, from government organizations and US organizations all around the world. Um, and I, I hold a number of different leadership positions, um, most notably the International Association of Hydrogeologists. Uh, I'm on the board of directors and I say this as a means to, uh, I hope, and, and I, I'm, I'm certain that this lecture won't just end here, but in fact, it will lead to collaborations and, and communications, maybe memorandums of understandings between UJ and, and Brajaya uh, University. So um, this doesn't have to end here. That's, that's really the point that I'm making. Uh, very quickly about me, my research, I'm, I'm the director of the Water Resources Remote Sensing Program here at UGA. Uh, and my research focuses primarily in a very broad sense on complex and interrelated problems uh, using what you'll see as field-based data, remote sensing, data science, and models. Uh, I think when you're thinking about water resource management or groundwater sustainability, you have to think about it from a very broad sense. Uh, I, I don't want to say gone are the days where we can think about one individual science. We really have to, to come together um, and, and, and we'll see and talk a little bit more about why. I've been fortunate then to go all around the world for a number of different projects. You can see UGA or the University of Georgia is here in the southeastern part of the United States. That's where I'm located here. Um, but I've been able to travel. Um, and in fact, this is an outdated list, but travel to many different places around the world to give lectures, to do research, to, to learn from the communities. And, and I did even travel to Indonesia back in, in 2013. And that was actually part of a program that I'm not going to explain too much other than to say that th these resources still exist. So um, we had a program between myself and the University of Kentucky um, and, and a number of universities in, in Indonesia, including University of Brajaya, uh, where we created a program called Advancing Research and Capacity in Hydrologic Education and Science. And, and here's the web page. Uh, and on that web page, you'll see some of the projects that we've done with, with, with JetFon, with FISO, with Novia. Uh, some of the folks that I get to see their familiar faces online uh, and you know there's videos of what we've done there's tutorials and so I, I partly say this as a way to encourage people to to um, continue to think about those things uh, you know we, we did workshops we did field research this is just an example again kind of tying into what this lecture is about today we talked about ArcGIS how what is geospatial science we thought about you know doing advanced GIS techniques. So this is what that's showing a little bit. We then went in country to do field research. So, so we did um, two weeks of field research in Indonesia. Um, you can see at different universities in the field uh, and some of the caves. Uh, and so that was a lot of fun. You can see Faisal and, and, and a few others in the pictures too. Um, but so we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun doing that. Um, and some more field research that we did in some of the, the rivers. Uh, and so my outline, kind of getting to the, the purpose of this talk, is really I want to cover a few main topics, right? So first is why is remote sensing or geospatial information important? You know, what really is the purpose of having this, this type of information? Um, I think it's important to discuss what's the current science in hydrology and groundwater management. I, I kind of went with a more general term in hydrology to give a little bit of background on, on remote sensing. Uh, you know, I'm a little bit unfamiliar with everyone's technical experience with remote sensing. So I want to give a little bit of a primer um, and then some examples of my research, but this will come more tomorrow and of course answer questions. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping if I'm successful at doing this, that you'll be able to see things a little bit more clearly and see that I'm in the Gunak Wallet Forest uh, in this particular case back in, in 2013, okay? So part one and part two will be tomorrow, well, tomorrow morning for you, tomorrow evening for me. Uh, is going to be, part one is going to be thinking about spatial and remote sensing analysis. And really it all starts, why we do this is because, and you're probably mostly all familiar with this, but traditionally is, is thinking about groundwater or hydrogeology or water resources, we have to have enough information. Ideally that gold standard is field data, right? Whether it be a groundwater well, a surface water gauge, a precipitation gauge. And unfortunately there's a, a global trend that is happening. And that global trend is that the networks that exist globally, not just in the US, not just in Indonesia or somewhere else, but they're, they're either insufficient or declining. 
Okay, this is a number of papers that have showed this. This is an example of if you were looking at rain or discharge data, you know, you might say that parts of the US are okay, but other parts aren't. And that's certainly not the case for a global perspective. In addition, on the right, this is showing a graph of the temporal distribution. So it, so it turns out in the 1980s is when we actually peaked in hydrologic information. We knew more in the 1980s than we do in 2021. We had more gauges operating more consistently in 1980 that we did in, in that we do, well, at least in 2014 is where this goes. And I really think this is sending a huge message that yes, we want field data. This is not a replacement. Geospatial and remote sensing is not a replacement for field data, but rather it's a call or an adoption that says we need to use field data in conjunction with other tools. That's how we're going to solve 21st century problems. Okay. So, you know, in my case, and what you'll see is we think about hydrogeology, we think about remote sensing, GIS, modeling, geochemistry. That's really how we're going to be able to solve it because nowhere, including in the United States, do we not, we have enough data to really answer the science questions and the management questions and the decision-making questions that, that center around water resources. Um, and so what you'll see, and, and what I'll give some examples of today and, and a lot more tomorrow is, you know, in my particular case, uh, you know, I do a number of different field approaches that you can see here. We set up physical models. We set up hydrologic models. Um, we use LIDAR data sets. And some of these terms might not be familiar with you yet. That's okay. Um, and then, you know, now I use UAVs or drones and, and to get hyper resolution information. And this is that showing, you know, impact craters that we're looking at here in Australia. Um, so it's really thinking about what approaches can we use to, to answer very important and age old questions. So the next part I want to share is where I think hydrologic science is moving, where the general scientific community believes hydrologic science is moving. And I know this is a very busy slide. Um, and so I want to, to just focus on a few things. Um, this was a really an interesting paper that, that came out um, by Kathy McCurley and Water Resources Research. And what they, what she and, and the, and the co-authors have done is they looked at about the last 50 years of research in, in hydrologic science. And what they found was that we are becoming more interdisciplinary. We're not just looking at groundwater anymore. Okay, we're, we're looking at groundwater and ecology. How does the groundwater impact humans? How does it impact organisms? We're not just looking at groundwater from how much water is there, but from a socio-economic standpoint, socio-hydrology, what does that mean for farmers? What does that mean for agricultural development, city urban planning? Um, and so this is what this is showing. I know it's complicated, but the idea is, is when you're looking at this, you'll see that we're, we're moving towards these trans or interdisciplinary sciences with groundwater. It's not to say we don't answer common groundwater questions, but it's, it's we've understand now that it's a lot more complex than just understanding how much water is in the subsurface. Uh, and, and that's what these, these parts are showing. In fact, even more further, if you're looking at just hydrogeology, that would be here, if everybody can see that, um, that is actually sort of plateaued and the singularity of groundwater has been declining slightly, whereas thinking about watershed and groundwater has been in increasing. Thinking about socio-hydrology, that's been increasing. Eco-hydrology, that's been increasing. So. Uh, we're moving a little bit in, in how our science is happening. The second, again, uh, maybe a little complicated, uh, it was a, a, a vision um, by the National Academy of Sciences, that's Engineering Medicine, it's an organization here in the United States, um, where they, they uh, have about 200 scientists from a sci around the world to talk about what is the next generational questions in science. And one of their 12 questions, they came up with 12 of them. One of their 12 was number eight was water cycle changes. Basically, they want to know about water resources. You know, other ones have to do with, you know, energy and so forth. But this was how is the Earth's water cycle changing? And these, these are quotes from what they said. They said, understanding current and future changes to the water cycle, i.e. groundwater and other parts, requires fundamental knowledge of the hydroterrestrial system and how it interacts with other physical, biological, and chemical processes. And that's important because here we say we not only have to understand 
the foundation of hydrogeology of groundwater. But we also then have to understand how that actually interacts with physical, biological, and chemical. That's the first part. The second part is really what this talk is about. Observations from space or air you know, will be increasingly vital for quantifying volumetric and temporal changes of different parts of the cycle. Improved remote characterization of subsurface hydrologic dynamics, groundwater, has aided the study and has expanded our knowledge of spatial and depth scales. And this really is the crux of what I'm gonna to try to talk about today. We understand how important it is. What we want to do is to think about and to understand that remote sensing and data science, you know, we academically, and I'm sure all of you have been hearing some of these buzzwords, we call them. That, that's a big part, data science and remote sensing and geospatial information. These are problems that, that you all, the students anyway, the students on this, on this lecture, you're going to be solving these problems. I'm getting old now to solve some of these problems this way. I rely on my students to do some of the things that I'm going to show you in these slides. Um, because these are the things that you're equipped for, you're knowledgeable with, you know, you know programming. I know Faisal on this call at one programs all the time. You know, I'm certain he's a better programmer than I am. Uh, and so the idea is, is that really this is a call to you. This is a call to you to understand the geospatial information, remote sensing, it's going to be very vital to understanding hydrology and groundwater sustainability. It's, it's you. The last thing, um, just kind of fitting into it, I think it, um, a couple of different directions, it's going to be a critical need to move towards interdisciplinary. I, I showed you an example of somebody doing that. Um, what that means is when we think about a problem, let's say, you know, is there enough groundwater in, in um, you know, a portion of Indonesia you know, traditionally what we've done is we said, well, let's bring in hydrologists, let's bring in ecologists, biologists, and engineers and, and, and work on that same problem. And we call that multidisciplinary. Then we started to say, I think we need to move towards interdisciplinary, where really we're working together to think about how, if we engineer a dam, that's actually going to impact the groundwater system. That's where you have this overlap in this Venn diagram. Um, but now we're really moving towards a, a transdisciplinary. So we're integrating the sciences with the social sciences, with the health sciences, with humanities, with, with government. Um, and again, that's, that's kind of the direction I think we're moving. Um, the second is how can we integrate across scales? See, the, the amazing part about field data is that, you know, it can give us a, a fairly accurate, what we would consider very accurate, understanding of some hydrologic process. If, if you had a groundwater well and it said the depth of water was 10 feet, we know a little bit something about the subsurface. But what does that mean to the neighboring university? How is, that, how is it different in Jakarta versus Milan? Uh, you know, it's very different. So we would have to have what? A thousand wells in between these two cities right, uh, across the Java mainland? That, that's probably too many. So we have to find ways to integrate across scale all the way down from the poor scale to the entire uh, country of Indonesia, as an example. And so um, I'm, gonna, these are, I'm not gonna give too many details, but you know, we have researchers here within my group that are looking at poor scale. We use microscopes and, and micro CT to look at very small scale uh, groundwater changes and dynamics. Um, I've done research and published research on looking at field scale. So this is looking at um, watershed dynamics. Uh, and then a little bit more recently as well, looking at countrywide scale. So we're kind of going from poor scale, field or watershed scale to, in this particular case, uh, regional scale. And, and how do we do that? Well, this is the traditional microscopes. This is traditional field. And this is going to be remote sensing. I'm going to go into this one a lot more detail tomorrow um, because we're using some of the uh, newer satellites and newer methods to be able to do that. So I'll, I'll go into that tomorrow. But the idea is that's it's important to integrate across scale. Um, the other is to leverage advances in remote sensing and hydrologic modeling. So again, this is the preview to tomorrow. This is sort of just to get you excited for tomorrow to come back uh, tomorrow. And you know, uh, one of my former students and I have, have looked at using a satellite called GRACE. It's, it's been the first and only satellite still that exists on planet Earth or outside of planet Earth, so to speak, um, that measures groundwater via space. Okay? And, and that's what this is talking about. Um, we have then taken that groundwater and combined it with hydrologic models. 
And then we developed machine learning techniques and algorithms. So we said, look, we can understand data science and improve our understanding of groundwater dynamics if we think about other variables that might impact groundwater. For example, the land surface temperature, the discharge, the soil moisture, the vegetation capacity. These are variables that are connected to groundwater without measuring actual groundwater. And if we can see patterns or similarities, then we might actually be able to see groundwater in a much better resolution. We can integrate across scale. Uh, and then lastly, we can look at it at a very fine scale uh, once you know a little bit more about GRACE when we're thinking about watersheds. And this is an example of we can see temporal changes in a watershed um, from a groundwater perspective. So this is looking at how can we see how groundwater withdrawal impacts stream discharge even. So that's another example. And then the last part is to implement data science into hydrology. This is a, a key thing, a key term. This is really the crux of this presentation, data science. And so data science means, you know, thinking about data mining operations, data simulation, um, and, and data fusion. And I'll explain some of these terms. Um, so how can, in a remote sensing perspective, what does that mean? It means, you know, we have satellite data all the way back to the 1970s for free for anybody. Anybody in the world can go to nasa.gov and download Landsat data back to the 1970s. So if you said, well, I'm very interested in some principle that has been happening in Indonesia or some other field site of yours, you can get that information. We have to learn to not get excited about the new shiny satellite and actually think about how we can use historical data to help us. We can use current, like the one I just mentioned of GRACE. We can use current satellites to, to help us. And then what's the future? We integrate all of these through a data science perspective. So as I said, really data science means data fusion. How do I take two different data sets? In this case, I'm going to say they're two different satellite data sets, satellite remote sensing data sets and be able to put them on the same wavelength, to put them on the same scale, to put them in the same context that now they're actually being used together, meaning soil moisture can also be used with groundwater, as an example. How do we mine that data? Are there large databases for this? Can we, are there programs? Can, you know, can we find ways to, to go through thousands upon thousands upon thousands of files? Um, you know, in the other side of my office right now, you know, I have a quote unquote supercomputer uh, and that supercomputer has to have 64 separate cores. And the reason is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moving terabytes of data every day because this is th these files are becoming larger and larger. So we have to find better practices for mining that data. And then can we learn and actually train and develop machine learning techniques where we are thinking about you saying, can we predict patterns? Can we use computers? Can we use knowledge, statistical knowledge to actually predict what some of these changes might be? Um, and I say this because, you know, everyone I think is always a little scared that, oh, this means we're being replaced <laughs> by some machine of some context. But I think the exact opposite. I think if people do these, and not trained for it, it's dangerous, right? We're, we're all scientists. And it, science literacy to me is a very important topic. And so, you know, we, I think in, particularly in the global context today in the world we are in and with COVID and other things. What I mean by that is, you know, we wanna make sure that when somebody has a result from machine learning that it, that it still passes that scientific rigor. Um, because otherwise, you know, we could be sending out misinformation. So we wanna make sure about that. And so just some very few examples of data fusion that I've done in my research. Um, it actually started back when I was doing um, my PhD. I looked at trying to identify and verify that rainfall and, and recharge events were happening in, in remote areas um, via satellite. And so what I would do was actually try to put together, uh, simulate about six or seven different satellite sensors and try to look for things. I would come up with techniques to, to read in the data, subset the data to a region, try to identify events. I would verify it through cloud movements and cloud patterns. And I won't get into why here unless you ask a question. I would look at vegetation differences between them, soil moisture differences. 
And this was an automated process called ResGem. It's a remote sensing extraction tool. Still exists. You can download that software. That's a little out of date now, but nonetheless, um, it allows someone to uh, simulate different data sets, put them all together to try to um, to verify events are taking place. And then we move that into predicting. This was this was the the major part coming out of my postdoc, which was predicting. Um, it, it, well, it's a remote sensing solution for estimating runoff and recharge in arid environments. And so this was really the first of its kind of how can we integrate remote sensing through hydrologic models, which you can see here, to be able to estimate hydrologic processes, in my case, in arid environments, but you can modify it for elsewhere. And that's really what this is, is coming through. The second is the machine learning. I'm, I'm, you know, I can go through this in more detail now or in tomorrow. Um, but this is just an example of one of those uh, machine learning techniques that we've done where we've looked at a number of different dependent factors, things that might impact groundwater. And so we're looking at the satellite water storage changes. We're looking at precipitation from satellite. We're looking at vegetation from satellite. Um, then we're looking at some global land surface models uh, and, and other parameters we have to make them into some common language, right? Some common context. We have to basically average them, resample them. And then ultimately, these are what we're getting from it. And we use these inputs, we do these neurons, and ultimately we hope that we can come up with an accurately trained model to predict groundwater changes on a better sp spatial and temporal scale. So instead of just saying, I have 50 wells in Milan, I now can tell you what's happening across Java as a whole, from a, you know, in a larger perspective. I might not be able to see what's happening from one neighborhood to the next, but across the entire island, uh, we can do that. Uh, and then data mining is the last one. This one's a little bit less about groundwater. Well, it's about groundwater, but in this case, it's, it's, it's thinking about it from a land subsidence. Um, so we can use something called interferometry, which is using um, radar pass images to look at land deformation. So major pumping, this is a major, major agricultural area in Morocco. Uh, and because of the groundwater withdrawal, they, the water table has dropped something like 30 meters over the last 30 years um, from all the pumping that they was taking place. And so that has caused the land service to subside. Okay, so, so in this case, they wanted to know how fast was the land falling or subsiding and you know, we can use interferometry for that. So in fact, these dots that you see are the results. We're seeing that in Uled Berhil, we're getting about 20 millimeters per year, the ground is actually sinking 20 millimeters per year and so forth okay. um, to think about that. So, so it's moving two centimeters or so, um, you know, it's about an inch per year to think of over the last 30 years. Um, the data mining concept behind that is, is we can perhaps combine that with GPS data. This was work by uh, Kristen Larson, um, and we can actually find information. And I'm not going to go through all this, but we can find information that verifies some of these results. Okay, that's that's a, an idea that we're mining other information. Uh, another last example is some more recent research in Australia where we're using UAVs. This is a linear dune. You can see our car and some people here. We can combine um, set or drone or UAV data to look at thermal and or um, temporal changes across dunes. So we're mining different information. All right, does anybody have any questions at this point? If not, I'm going to continue on with, with some of the remote sensing fundamentals. Okay, so again, some of you may have had a course with this, and this will just be a little bit of a primer, but um, I, I wanted to go into this thinking that, that most of this would be new to you, that you, you might know some remote sensing, you might have applied some of this remote sensing, um, and, and some of you may not have ever seen this before. And so I think it's important because, again, I think it's important to understand the basics of a concept before we start applying it. And so I'm going to go through some, some remote sensing fundamentals. Some of them I'll go through a little bit more quickly. Uh, and, and we can always ask questions about it after. So in its basic form, right, remote sensing is the measurement or acquisition of information from an object that is not in, in physical contact with it. That's the general geophysics is a form of remote sensing, okay? 
generally when we're talking about it in this context, we've been thinking about satellite platforms. That's what this one will be showing. But of course it can be by plane, it can be a helicopter, and now more recently via uh, drones or UAVs. Um, really what we're trying to do is try to get some specific information about an object. And in this case, we're trying to get its electromagnetic radiation, whether they be reflected, re emitted or backscattered. That's the key part is this part here. That's what we're trying to get that information. Okay, we're not just visually looking at images. That's part of remote sensing. Visual is a, is a key, but we're trying to get more useful information. And some of the advantages of such a, a, a technique is that it is unobtrusive, right? We, we can monitor something from a safe distance. We can monitor it to cover a large systematic area. So that's, that's another thing. We can program it to be systematic. We can have controlled conditions, you know, in the field, we might not have that. Um, and, and lastly, it, we can offset that lack of data. That was an important part I shared in the beginning of this is we have a lot of information, field data, but, but not everywhere. So this is another tool to offset it. I can't stress this part enough, the limitations of remote sensing. Uh, it's, it's, it's very exciting to use remote sensing, but it can often be the greatest limitation is that it's oversold. Okay. Um, as an example, you know, somebody might say, well, I've downloaded this satellite precipitation data um, from a satellite called GPM or TRIM, T-R-M-N. And, you know, it tells me that the precipitation in Indonesia is this. And, you know, it, it's exciting because we don't know what it might be without rain gauges. And we want to use it. But the reality is, is you see, there's lots of problems. In fact, I was on the NASA science team that, that developed that sensor. So I know <laughs> intimately what problems there are uh, with, with satellite sensors regarding remote uh, precipitation in snow or something called complex topography and so forth. Um, ultimately, we are still making decisions. We might make poor decisions, human beings. Uh, so that's a big one. And of course, it can be expensive. Um, Particularly if you're flying airborne, you think you're, you're actually you know, coming up with your own flight. If you're using uh, free satellite data, then obviously that's a little bit better. The general process, again, I'm going through this a little bit quickly. Uh, we think about some physical object that we're interested in. We acquire the data via satellite sensor in this case. We extract that information, something we call image analysis. So we have our images now and we try to extract the patterns. There's all kinds of techniques for that and then we apply it to our general application. That's, that's the very quick version of what really the remote sensing process should look like. Um, it shouldn't be, you know, we download the data and then we start to look at it. Um, you know, we should have our ideas of mind be a priority, as we say. Um, some other key terms, remote sensing data can be collected both passively or actively. So in a passive sensor, we record the EM radiation um, from that is reflected or, or emitted naturally from, you know, from the land surface, okay? Uh, in an active sensor, we send out the EM energy and then record the amount of flux coming back. Um, that's considered like radar or LIDAR. That's great because we don't have to rely on it being sunny that day. We don't have to rely on it being only during the day. Um, you know, we can send out specific regions that we're more interested in, but there are different sensors in terms of passive and active. Uh, there is a lot on this slide. I'm assuming I will share all the slides uh, if you don't have them already. Um, so you can go through this in a little bit more detail. This is really to say that all, ultimately what we're looking at when you see a remote sensing image, and it might look visual, you might see a house on the image and it, it might look like it's a visual image, but reality is, is it's actually looking at the electromagnetic radiance, okay, recorded within an instantaneous field of view of an optical system. And so what that means is the amount of electromagnetic radiance that's reaching the sensor is going to be a function of a lot of factors. Wavelength, the location of the sensor, the temporal information, when it was actually acquired and how, what are the angles, right? I mean, some of you might be amateur photographers or professional photographers, um, and we needed to know the angles between the sensors, the cameras, and our objects, the polarization of the light that's, that's coming, and then something called radiometric resolution. How can we actually 
what kind of precision do we have when we are getting the data back? Uh, and I, I mostly say this because it, it becomes a complex interaction that isn't straightforward uh, and, and has to be thought about as we're, as we're using remote sensing data. And ultimately what we get, what we hope to, to get from this is that we can identify an object remotely if we knew its spectral signature. Okay, so what we see in a satellite image, although we only see one particular instantaneous moment, but every object on Earth has a fingerprint, a spectral signature that through some wavelength, in this case, it's going from 0.4 to 1.2 nanometer or micrometers, it will have a percent reflectance, reflectance of energy. And really what we would, that profile, that signature allows us to differentiate different objects. You have to remember from a remote sensing standpoint, what we get is a single image at a single wavelength. So you would be seeing one image, let's call it at 0.6 micrometers. And in that particular case, 60% of it or so is gonna be a red sand pit being reflected and so on and so forth. We, we're not seeing its entire thing. So we would have to collect thousands or five or 10 or hundreds of images to complete a profile. But if we can do that, it allows us to look at different grasses. It allows us to differentiate between water and, 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 and dry soil, between contaminants that might exist, between you know, areas that have soil moisture that that's, might include groundwater dynamics, um, different rock types, for example. I'm a geologist, so I, can, I, I love rocks. Um, but that's going to also be impacted. Okay, that, that spectral signature the reason it exists is because there are constantly having different absorptions, and I won't get into all of them and why they all exist, but throughout this electromagnetic magnetic profile, you know, the percent reflectances will be higher or lower if there's absorption. So for example, there's huge absorbers of water in the 1.4 to 2-ish to 2.6 range. So if I have water in the soil versus dry soil, you're going to see this absorption versus a dry soil here. So that's a differentiate. I can also tell water bearing aluminum silicates, you know, maybe something like a uh, serpentinite, you know, if, it, if it's in, in a particular rock and vice versa. So, you know, really we're thinking about all these factors that have to do with um, ways that it can absorb that spectral signature. Um, when I keep talking about remote sensing resolution, I'm thinking about four key terms um, that, that you want to know if you don't already. Uh, and that is spatial, spectral, temporal, and radiometric. I promise you this is the golden rule. This is what everybody searches for. Ideally, you want all four of these to be the best. And I can tell you, you will never have it. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it's a cost benefit analysis you have to pick and choose what is going to be the most important. If you wanted the highest spatial resolution, then you probably aren't going to have a good temporal resolution. Meaning if you wanted to see what's happening from a groundwater standpoint in a very small town in Indonesia, great. But you're only seeing it once a month now. I don't know what's happening day to day. There's going to be a trade-off, but I wanna go through each one of these. I just want to recognize um, that you're going to have to make decisions, okay? So the first is the spatial resolution. Really, that's the size of each individual pixel, as we might call them. And so if you can imagine if the resolution was 80 meters by 80 meter box, then this is what that image might look like. Okay, it's not, not visually, it's not very helpful, but that doesn't mean there's still not good information in there because what it's doing is it's now saying what is the electromagnetic radiation averaged over 80 meters by 80 meters? So whether there was dry soil, you know, whether there was um, some vegetation and water, it's now integrated. And you can see the higher the resolution, this is a half a meter by half a meter, you could finally see that in fact, there is vegetation on the par, there's some streets and some houses. Okay, so that's spatial, what's the size of the individual pixel? The second is going to be the spectral resolution, okay? So this is the number, the number and the size of spectral regions that the sensor records. 
So what I mean by that is, is I, when I talked about the spectral profile, I said, we don't have continuous profile. We, we only get little points. And so a satellite sensor, in this case, this is called the Landsat multispectral scanner. It has four bands. We call their, their locations bands. And it can look at, at four regions and four regions only, green, red, near infrared, and near infrared again. Okay. Um, so that in this case, its spectral resolution isn't very good because it only has four bands. You know, we might have newer ones today. The newest Landsat has like 16 bands. Off the top of my head, I think it's 16, the Landsat Ollie. Um, so it, so it's improved. Okay, we can we can better form that spectral profile now. But also it's the size of the region. So this gets into this concept of what we call full width half maximum. What that means is we can't pick the exact wavelength that we want. If we said, hey, we know that we can look at a groundwater process if we saw it at 0.75, a satellite sensor is incapable of seeing only 0.75. Why? Because it needs enough energy to get enough of it to pass through the atmosphere. It needs enough time to be sitting there long enough to record enough energy. So what we do is we actually open up the channel, as we call it, and we're really getting energy from 0.65 to 0.85. So when you hear that, if I were to go back a slide, that, hey, we've measured green, we didn't measure green at its exact wavelength. We are recording the full width, the full width at half maximum. So here's the maximum, there's half the maximum, the full width. So technically, in this particular case, we have a hundred nanometer bandwidth. We are at, we were recorded as 0.75, but really our sensor is recording from, from 0.7 to 0.8. So that's an important concept to think about. Um, so our spectral resolution says not only how many bands do we have, but how sort of tight is this window? How small is this window? The smaller the window, the better for us. Okay. Uh, along those lines of spectral, you know, uh, you might hear this term in a remote sense and we call it multispectral. So that means we're recording in multiple bands. So this would be four different bands, as I mentioned before, a blue, green, red, and near infrared. And if you notice, I don't just give an exact wavelength, we give that range again. So we know we're, we're recording within a range. We call that multispectral. When we want hundreds of images, that's called hyperspectral. Okay, um, that, that's the part where we're thinking about hundreds of images, in this case, 224 bands. And there are satellites that are, that are hyperspectral images. Um, when you're doing that, you're probably gonna have to increase computer resources, as an example. The, the next part is going to be temporal resolution. So this is how often the sensor acquires the data. So what's its repeat time? And in the Landsat case, it's every 16 days. And so you might have one on June 1st and the next time June 17th and the next time July 3rd. Um, of course, you know, ideally, we probably want to see processes on a, on a better temporal scale. That's temporal resolution. Uh, and then the last one is radiometric. That's the sensitivity of a detector to detect small differences in EM radiation. Uh, I won't dwell on this one too much, but it has to do with the science and, and, the, uh, and the engineering of the actual sensor itself. And so we have something called 7-bit, 8-bit, 9-bit, and 10-bit and further, for example. And what that means is when that information comes in, when we're looking at different objects, how many bins or quantiles could we put it in? The smaller the bit resolution, the, the less bins we can have, the less uh, understanding of variations on the ground surface. So what that would look like is something like this. You know, if I have a one bit quantization, you know, this is effectively binary, even though I have lots of different features here, right? If you look up here, I have roads, I have houses, I have roofs, uh, the water. You know, if it, we had a two level scenario, we only just see two, two binary things, your own one. You know, the higher we go up to an eight bit system, we have 256 levels now of differentiation that we might be able to use. So that, that's called radiometric resolution. Now you can't pick these, by the way, these are, these are established, right? So if you, if you want to know something about groundwater, you use gray satellite. 
you can't say, well, I want grace four bit information or eight bit, or I want it to repeat at a different time. That's, that's the trade off. We're stuck with what we have. Uh, and we have to, to, to work around, but it's important to understand it um, because that might make a choice as to which satellite data can be useful or might not be useful. Uh, without going into these details, um, there are some things that we generally want to do to satellite images. Sometimes they, they came processed, um, but oftentimes we have to do two things to them. We call that radiometric and or geometric corrections. Um, not always, but really what we're trying to do is correct and remove noise uh, and then properly align it to some geographic location. That, that's a big part of digital image processing. Uh, and that's a, a, you know, people use ArcGIS for this, Envy, a lot of different programs to do digital image processing. We're moving on a little bit from some of the, the principles of remote sensing. I, I want to talk a little bit about electromagnetic radiation to, to, to refresh everybody's physics background um, and to think about EM radiation and what that means in the context of remote sensing. Um, so we know energy is recorded by a remote sensing system goes through fundamental interactions. Okay? So it's radiated by particles from the source, which is the sun, or if it's an active, it's from a machine of some kind. It propagates through some vacuum of space at the speed of light. It interacts, of course, with the atmosphere. It interacts with the Earth's surface, and then interacts with the atmosphere once again on the way out or other objects on the Earth's surface. And then finally, it reaches our sensor, which by the way, interacts with our systems, our filters, our emulsions, our detectors, and all these other things. And so it's really not a simple system um, that we're looking at. And so when that really is looking at this fundamental interaction pathway, this is what this looks like. We have solar irradiance coming from the sun. It's transmitted through the atmosphere. Some of it is lucky and it goes straight through without interacting at all, right? And some of that goes straight back to our sensor. That would be this T0, one path one and LT back. But the reality is sometimes it, 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 it scatters in the atmosphere, it absorbs in the atmosphere. Sometimes it hits another particle and bounces back onto your target area. Sometimes when it's re go exiting the atmosphere, or the atmosphere it's interacting again. So we have to think about and account for all these, all these sensors. Um, I, I like to think of it a different way. This is a little bit easier diagram that I like to show. Um, but the idea is, is we have our incoming electromagnetic radiation. It can be processed in the atmosphere, other objects. Um, and then of course, what we have coming back is gonna be parts that's reflected from our objects, reflected from the atmosphere, but also what is emitted from planet Earth. We are still a, a thermal body that will emit energy much like the sun does. And we're getting all of that information simultaneously. And this is the information we have to try to process. Um, this is the one part I'll probably go through quicker um, because it's not as, as relevant, but I just wanted to put it on here mostly so that you can have the slides. Um, but really when we're thinking about then how it's propagating through space, we have either a wave or a particle model uh, the wave model that everybody is familiar with um, is thinking about wavelengths. So that depends on the amount of energy that a charged particle is accelerated. That you know, the idea is that the electrical charge is accelerated. We know that the wavelength is the distance between two maximum or minimums, and that the frequency is the number of wavelengths per unit time. Okay. And so what that might look like, of course, this would be our wavelength. We would have a higher frequency because we'd have how quickly it reaches two successive troughs or peaks. Um, when we're thinking about it in terms of remote sensing, you know, we're thinking about what type of energy we have, what type of wavelength or frequency. So we're, if we're at the longer wavelengths, we're talking microwave energy. If we're at the shorter wavelengths, we're thinking visible light, um, but there are trade-offs for this. For example, the longer wavelengths can transmit through the atmosphere because the higher or the lower frequency rather. Um, but there's going to be a little bit less energy in them, less energy in them, right? We know the gamma rays or X-rays are going to be higher energy. And so if we want to use something that can get through the atmosphere, because let's, let's in Indonesia, uh, the precipitation, it, it, it's heavy. You know, you'd be hard pressed to find visible satellite scenes without having clouds in them. So you might resort to microwave images. But now the trade-off is 
you might not get the same level of detail of information. So this, this is that, that trade-off within that. Um, we can come up with these nice formulas to think about um, the relationship between frequency and, and wavelength, and I won't, I won't go through that now. Um, but what this means is that, you know, the sun is producing some continuous energy um, of radio waves that, that bathe planet Earth. Planet Earth accepts that, but also re-radiates its own because it's a thermal body. And then we're reading all of that. That's what this is basically saying. And we're left with our famous electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and satellites, in this particular case, can view everything all the way from visible all the way to, to radar. And then even a little bit beyond. That's what really the, the parts we're looking at from, from a satellite perspective uh, for the most part. Uh, and again, there's a lot of words on here, but this becomes important uh, when we're thinking about remote sensing principles, um, something called the Stefan Boltzmann Law. And what that means is we can characterize the amount of energy, the amount of radiance or irradiance coming off the sun. So we might want to know that because if we know that the sun is, is, is providing X amount of irradiance, and we would then know if our objects are absorbing you know, X amount. And so we know um, that the sun at 6,000 degrees Kelvin is considered a black body. The Stefan Boltzmann law says that the total emitted radiation from a black body like the sun is proportional to the fourth power of its absolute temperature. So since we know the absolute temperature of the sun, 6,000 degrees Kelvin, we can say that in this particular case, we can know the total emitted, total emitted radiation, okay? So what that means is, and I highlight the important part, thus the amount of energy emitted by an object is a function of its temperature. We can do that with any object, not just the sun. We can do it with planet Earth. Okay, we can do it for man-made objects. And so what this would look like is when we are looking at electromagnetic profile, this is the maximum. This is the maximum and where it would happen, amount of radiation that we're going to see. If you wanted to see something at three, wave, three micrometer wavelength, you're not going to see it very much. It doesn't exist because we know that the most amount of energy is going to come from the sun and it's going to have something called a dominant wavelength, and it's not going to be here. We see energy that's emitted in the thermal range, not from the sun, but that's emitted from planet Earth. Okay. And it's lower intensity, right? Here's the sun, here's planet Earth. We don't, we don't emit as much energy, and we, we emit it at a different wavelength, and that's for the reason I'm going to show you next. And that's called Wien's displacement law. In addition to knowing its total energy, we can also determine what wavelength a black body would emit that energy. What's the dominant? We call that Wien's displacement law. So we can say its dominant wavelength will be a function of, again, its constant divided by its total absolute energy that we, that we measured. So in this case, if I use my constant divided by sun of 6,000 degrees Kelvin, then I can say its dominant wavelength will be 0.483 micrometers. So if I go backwards for a minute, you're going to see that its dominant wavelength is going to be in the green. Its dominant wavelength is going to be in the green here. Um, I can do the same thing with planet Earth, and you're going to find out that its dominant wavelength will be um, a little bit closer to nine, uh, a little bit high nine, I forget the exact number off the top of my head, oh, 9.66, there we go, uh, because it's, you know, 300 degrees Kelvin, uh, and in this particular case, we're going to have a different dominant wavelength. So we can do this for lot, lots of different thermal sources, by the way. And why does this matter? Why is all of this important? It's because what really what this says is thus the energy of a quantum is inversely proportional to its wavelength. Energy is inversely proportional to its wavelength, i.e. the longer the wavelength, the lower its energy. So if you have a microwave wavelength, it is going to have less energy than some of the others. Um, and why does that matter from a remote sensing perspective? 
means that if we want or we, we would need to look at the ground longer in a longer wavelength. If we were using a microwave sensor compared to a visible, I might have to look at the visible for a minute and then the sensor got all of its information and it can move to a new part of Indonesia. But now that I have less energy in the longer, I have to now sit there for a day to get the same amount of data. And I'm making up the day, but you get the context. And really what that means is that will tell you, ultimately, we're not gonna have the same temporal resolution from a longer wavelength sensor. It also means if I want the same day, let's say I want the same day, how can I create the same day, but still have enough energy and make a larger spatial resolution? I now say, instead of looking at Jakarta, I'm going to look at the entire island. Even though I'm getting a little energy each spot, I can now get the entire island. So most of the time when you're looking at microwave data, even though it's great because we can penetrate through clouds, uh, or, or even vegetation in some regards, or even soil moisture in the soil itself, I'm probably going to have very coarse resolution data. If you wanted soil moisture, this is a great concept for groundwater. Soil moisture is such a critical thought and process for groundwater. If you wanted to know soil moisture, I promise you, you will never get it less than about four kilometer resolution, four kilometers. And that's even good. <laughs> Um, it's probably going to be higher than that. And the reason why is, is because of the, this concept. Okay, so that, that's always going to be a trade-off. Um, the last thing is, is in terms of this aspect of, of atmospheric energy is just, you know, it, it, it's interacting, of course, with the atmosphere. It's scattering, it's refracting, it's being absorbed, and it's being reflected. I won't go through each one. They're, they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, but what, what this means is we have windows, we call them atmospheric windows in, in a remote sensing concept. Um, and so, uh, for example, if we're looking at, you know, N2O or, or oxygen or ozone or, or carbon dioxide or, or water vapor, um, what, what those gases do in the atmosphere is they actually absorb some of that incoming radiation, right? So I said, hey, look, you know, the maximum amount that the sun can emit is X amount. We know that it's gonna come at this dominant wavelength, but we also know that because of the gases and, and other things that are happening in the atmosphere, they're gonna close down some of those wavelengths. So these areas in black, those are being totally absorbed by, by these gases. So let's take water vapor for, for an example. From, from four to about eight micrometers, it's being almost completely closed down. We, we will never get, um, uh, transmission, as we call it, we won't be able to see what's happening in that wavelength on planet Earth from a satellite perspective. So these are the individual gases. This bottom one shows the cumulative impact of the atmosphere. So this is why if I want to look at objects that are in the visible, I can do that. The white area is meant that I can transmit that. It, it penetrated through the atmosphere. If you said, you know, Adam, I want to see what's happening at these wavelengths, we cannot. Only way we can do it is if we go below the atmosphere. How can we do that? We fly a plane. We, we use a, a UAV. We are taking out the atmosphere as much as we can. That, that's, that's some of the things we're thinking about. Um, and so what that means from a perspective, on, this was that same graph. Uh, I'm really just talking about what these words say. But you know this, this light gray area, this would have been what the total amount based on means displacement and Stefan Boltzmann said but the reality is these areas in white. Because of all these gases, really what we're seeing is this. We don't even get that total amount of energy. We're only getting about what we call 1,500 um, um, watts per square meridian, um, steridian. But what we're also seeing is that there's going to only going to be certain windows that are good for us. Okay, that's really what this is saying. Um, and so why that matters? Well, that's because when I go all the way back to this wavelength and we're seeing these concepts of different materials, it's not as simple as just seeing that there's a lot that's going into this. You have to think about these interactions. We have to think about, you know, are we just seeing impacts of absorption or transmittance? Are we just seeing impacts of energy radiations or, or, or interactions within the atmosphere or scattering from targets? Um, and that's something we, we need to think about. It's not as easy as just 
uh, identifying a couple of these objects. Um, so a common sort of graph of this is that generally, um, you know, what we interested in from a scientific standpoint, this is a general one, I can show you a little bit better one, uh, that, you know, generally Earth's materials might be, you know, in these wavelengths, ground surface and water surface, if you're thinking about water bodies or wetlands, um, they might be at the high wavelengths, um, vegetation is going to be here and so on and so forth, okay. Um, how, if I can stop and ask how we do it on time, do we want to stop for questions? I, at this point, I just have a few examples of my research, but I can also do that uh, now, later, tomorrow. Um, so I want to make sure I have enough, leave enough time for questions. Um, do you want some uh, question session? That's kind of up to you. I can, I, I, you know, I can go for another five or so minutes and then we can do the questions. But if people, I didn't know how many questions we might have. Um, okay. So I, it's, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, let me ask the student first and the participant, maybe if they have some question regarding in the previous uh, uh, PPT, maybe they can uh, ask. Uh, to you directly. Uh, dear participant, if you have a question, comment, or some uh, feedback, you can raise your hand using a raise hand feature and then open your camera and then you can directly deliver your question or you can type in the chat box if you have uh, an internet problem or internet issue. Uh, Anyone to want to ask to professor? Mr. Jetpan, this is to uh, student raise hand. Oh, okay. Please, Mas David, you can deliver your question directly. Thank you, Mr. Jetpan. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, interesting presentation, Adam. Uh, my name is David. I want to ask two questions. First of all, um, for some particular uh, land use, uh, let's say in Jakarta, we have so many uh, land cover like concrete. Um, can, uh, could you please explain a little bit uh, detail uh, the accuracy of the remote sensing when we survey the uh, concrete uh, cover? Uh, my second question is, how about the vegetation? If some uh, land have uh, vegetation uh, uh, that cover the, uh, let's say, the river, uh, what the, I, uh, you, you have explained about the uh, function of the remote sensing. Um, my question is, what about the river that covered by the vegetation? Uh, how the, the treatment we use to make it more uh, accurate? Thank you, Adam. Yeah, that's, um, thanks, David. It, it's uh, two very good questions. Um, I'll start with the first one about how accurate is land use classification as a whole and perhaps maybe in an urban setting. I'll kind of think about it from two parts. Um, that's one part of the science that's really been evolving quite a bit. Um, there's, there's been a, a breakthrough in the number of techniques to be able to identify and verify different land use classifications. Um, so, for example, one of the, the most recent techniques is something called Geobia, uh, which is called geographically object based image analysis, image analysis. And so what that means is, um, again, computer simulations will pick um, patterns within uh, reflectance values to be able to train and then differentiate different classifications. Uh, that I would just say, I don't have a number, I will say that it, it's fairly accurate. Um, you know, of course it depends, right? It, it depends, the accuracy lies in the sensor itself in my opinion. The techniques I think are extremely accurate. What I mean by the sensor is if I have a sensor that is only looking at 30 meter resolution, 
but most of your difference in land use is smaller than that, 10 meters, 20 meters, it's not going to be very accurate then. You always want your satellite sensor to the resolution to be smaller than the differences in the field. If they are, the techniques are very accurate. When you, I don't know if you had a specific question related to different types of concrete, um, that becomes a little bit harder because concrete by definition is, is, you know, accumulation of different materials. That is probably going to skew that profile. That's probably possible from a UAV, but not satellite. You, you won't be able to see that differentiation that well from satellite, in my opinion. Um, that, that'd be the first thing. The second question you have, uh, you probably don't want to hear this answer, but I can tell you that one of the largest challenges in remote sensing is, in fact, what you just called subaquatic vegetation. Vegetation that's in a river is extremely difficult <laughs> to do from a remote because the water absorbs all of the energy. So water is a, by definition, is a perfect absorber. If I'm looking at a satellite image, it's supposed to have zero reflectance over water. And so even though there's vegetation, if it's not, if it's not exposed above the water, it is going to be nearly impossible to see vegetation that's, you know, in a wetland or in a salt marsh. Um, and the only way to do that perhaps would be to find times when the vegetation becomes exposed above the river. That's kind of what I would say. That makes sense. But I, I can, I, I'm more than willing to share a number of papers that, that talk about this. Thank you, Adam. Um, maybe I will limit uh, the question for three questions at this session. The second question is from Mas Panji. Please, Mas Panji, you can deliver your question. Thank you, Pak Jatan. Uh, Professor Adam, uh, in the slide you mentioned about GRACE, GRACE mission, and I read from the website, it uh, measures the Earth, Earth gravity field. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the output of the GRACE? Uh, as for Landsat, the output is the image, and from the image we can analyze this, so we can take the reference values to uh, interpret something. So, what about the the grace? Uh, what is the output of the grace? Is it number or is it a, an image also? Thank you. Great question. Um, I, so, I'm not sure if you will have the, the the chance to 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 be part of this tomorrow as well. I'm going to go into that exact question in a lot more detail. I will give you the short answer now. Um, you're right. When you're looking at a image like Landsat, the output is really a percent reflectance. When you're looking at a thermal image like Aster, the output is maybe topography, or maybe it's the amount of ther thermal emission. Grace does not do any of that. So Grace works by its output is uh, an image. Okay, it's a, it's a matrix of values, um, but that output is actually the changes in, in mass, it's a change in mass of Earth's mass. And the way the satellite works is that two satellites fly in tandem. And when one of them flies over an area that has a different mass, call it Mount Everest, right? It is going to be ever so slightly pulled to that larger mass body. And that slight change in distance is what it's actually measuring. That's what the satellite is. It's not measuring electromagnetic radiation, everything I just discussed. It's actually only measuring a change in distance between two satellites. Then it provides us with a formulation that that means there is X amount of mass that would below you. The trick is for us with groundwater, we don't care about the mountains, right? We care about water. And so the idea is, and it's an assumption, a careful one that we have to make, we're not looking at tectonic processes if we look at mass every week. We're not looking at glacial isostatic rebound every week. So if we actually see mass changes on a weekly scale, it's related to water. And that's, so we are making the inference that changes in mass equate to changes in water. 
And so really what they give us, they give us mass. What we convert the mass to is a change in water volume. And then we have to also, for us more interested in groundwater, I don't know where the mass is. Is it water in a lake? Is it water in a river? Is it in the soil or is it in the groundwater? So then we have to disaggregate that signal. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, Jedfan, I, I don't know if you want me to I see a question. Um, from okay. the, if, if you want me to answer those. Uh, yes, maybe from Novia. And then okay. maybe probably you can continue your uh, presentation and then maybe you can continue to the, another question in the next session, I think. Um, so the question talks about, you know, if we're increasing water demand, increasing population, groundwater exploitation, how do we fulfill the water supply? What's the, what, my question is how big is the impact of the situation, the ground, groundwater number in the world? Um, it's a, such a tough question. Uh, you know, I'll just say it's a large impact. I'll be political. Um, it's going to be a large impact. Uh, and I think it is, a, it's a problem that we have to face. Unfortunately, we have to face this individually as different nations. But the reality is, is guess what? We all know that groundwater, that water is, does not care about political boundaries. Water only cares about the, the, the science and, and the environment. And so most water is, are really transboundary questions, right? And so how do we do it? I think it's gonna be a matter of, of improving our knowledge of, of the processes. It's gonna be a matter of improving our, um, our, our sustainability practices you know, uh, moving from pivot irrigation to drip irrigation, um, you know, maybe changing our engineers, you know, I, I know most of you are engineers, you know, coming up with an engineering based solution to either, um, you know, store water. One example of this uh, that's happening in the United States and probably in Indonesia is that we are now trapping old river water. So river that's going to be lost to the ocean, we take it, we prevent it from going to the ocean. We bring it back upstream and we inject it as artificial recharge into the groundwater so that we could save it for times when we don't have precipitation. Right? That's, that's an example of an engineering based solution. So that, that's, that's the one thing I would say. Um, the best machine learning method. Um, there's no one size fits all. Uh, I, I will say I particularly use boosted regression trees. BRTs, um, and, and we do something called hyper-threading or hyper-boosting, but um, I, I, if you want, I can give you a slide that, that talks about the advantages or disadvantages of a couple of techniques. I, I'll add that for tomorrow if you're able to make it. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll stop there for now if you want, or just kind of go through these. How about I stop with these ones and, and if we don't have further questions then I can come back with them. Uh, if you want to continue, please continue. And then we can save the question for okay. the next uh, session. And uh, maybe if, uh, because I saw a lot of question in chat box and some in my chat uh, room, maybe if you don't mind, we can keep, uh, the question and if the time is not uh, enough for us and uh, to deliver directly for you, maybe I can email the question uh, for you, Rachel. And yeah, then I, I will uh, send it back to them. That, that if, sounds great, yeah. 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 Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Um, well, that, I will continue a, a little bit um, for some of these examples, but again, you will see some more of this tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to focus on, on remote sensing and hydrogeology specific, so it's going to be very tailored to groundwater tomorrow. Um, but my point is, is that there are a number of satellites that now look at hydrologic cycle parameters. That in fact, every process or reservoir of the hydrologic cycle, you know that all, all of those, is now measurable estimated, I should say, from space. Okay. So if we want groundwater, we want evapotranspiration, we want soil moisture, we want 
precipitation. We want to know how much lake levels are, ocean levels, whatever. Um, that, is, that, is, that is possible from freely available data, by the way. These are from NASA or the European Space Agency, a number of different uh, agencies. And so um, I will talk about some of these in particular tomorrow, like TRIM and GPM and GRACE, um, but, but it is possible. Okay? And, and I can go into some of these more details. Um, this is just another example of that. Um, there's just a few more that are on here called Calypso and CloudSat. Um, these are looking at lake levels, for example, wind patterns, you know, the visible information, precipitation, groundwater, and so on and so forth, ice, of course, and glacial systems. Um, but we, we can monitor every part of that. But again, we have to understand in that holistic system that that actually means some of them might be looking at longer wavelengths, some of them might have more or less energy, different resolutions, um, but, but it is possible. Some of them might have better accuracies, for example. Um, you know, GRACE is relatively recent, uh, you know, it's technically like 18 years now, but, but really it's just started to break through over the last 10. Um, so it's, it's a little bit less accurate than some of the things we might see from aqua, as an example, but, you know, we can talk about that. Um, so as, as I mentioned, you know, this is just a, a narrative of that same thing. If we want soil moisture, we can use SMAP. If we want inland water bodies, lakes or wetlands, we can use something called SWAT. Um, if we're looking at subsurface volume changes, we can use GRACE and their follow-on mission. That's a new GRACE satellite now. Um, glaciers, water quality. If you're thinking about water quality, there's PACE and others. Um, so it's there and I'd be also always happy to help uh, with those. Um, just another example of that, um, water volumes. I'm thinking of a more hydrologically water surface area. We can look at low spatial, high temporal. So that's going to be passive. You, you kind of know that difference now. That might be SSMI and MODIS. If we want higher spatial resolution, but we don't care about its temporal, well, then we can use things called ERS and NVSAT. These are some lo longer microwave ones. Water surface heights, water volumes, and topography, and so on and so forth. So this is really just a good breakdown of some of the trade-offs that we might be looking at um, and, and we might do, but, but it's all available and it's, it's, it's something we can think about when we're thinking about what is the best sensor. There is no best sensor, okay? It it's really just depends on your application. So one quick um, example I wanna give, and I'll go through it quickly and not really explain results, just more of the process. Um, an area of interest for me in my research is something um, called inland freshwater lenses. So um, perhaps to Novia's question, how do we understand, how do we mitigate these problems? I think we need to find alternative water resources. Um, one of those is called freshwater lenses. So um, you might think of this as freshwater lens. A freshwater lens means that uh, freshwater is sitting atop a saline system because due to its differences in density. This happens on every island on planet Earth. But I also know and, believe, and have seen that it happens inland, nowhere near islands. And it happens because of this map, right? So if you look at the global aspects, there are saline aquifers. And normally for us hydrogeologists or groundwater specialists, we don't want to talk about saline aquifers. That, that doesn't sound usable, right? But it turns out that it's these same saline areas, that's what these different colors represent, actually can form fresh water in areas that are remote areas that might be great for rural populations. Um, and all of that started with a trip that I had in Kuwait. So this is Kuwait here in the Arabian Peninsula. This is what it kind of looks like. Doesn't look like an environment suitable for water. It has a saline aquifer, okay? So it's not very usable. But really what happens is during these intense storms, you get channelized runoff. So this is different events that happen throughout Kuwait that it channelizes this runoff. And if it channelizes it quickly enough, the science, and I believe, and I've proven that you will actually create a freshwater lens underneath. It won't be there for forever, it won't be there for thousands of years, but it might be there for 500 years. Okay. And so what happens is that runoff that I showed you in that picture, it, it collects in a topographic depression now. And because now we have a higher hydraulic head, it's going to infiltrate very quickly. It will not just go be evaporated, right? You saw the pictures of Kuwait, you thought it might be evaporated. Well, not if there's enough water. And once there's enough water, this light blue shows we have fresh water now. This is the otherwise regional aquifer in green. Now we have enough fresh water 
that we created a lens. And these are small. These are small. I mean, how small? Well, some of them can be a few hundred square meters. Some of them can be upwards of 100 square kilometers or, or cubic kilometers, if we think, you know, well, maybe not cubic at that point. But, um, but you know, they can be very large and they're all over the world. Um, and it turns out that this one does exist. In the 1970s in Kuwait, in northern Kuwait, they were looking for oil and found water. And it's been under artesian and somewhat now more recently pumping for the last 50 years, fresh water. That lens has still existed for 50 years. It supports about 8% of the population of Kuwait. Okay. Now, in this case, they, they, they pump it and they bring it to Kuwait City. But, you know, I thought to myself, I bet this is happening in other areas. So this is what I've done. This is looking at Kuwait again. Um, that this location right here is where that known lens was, where I just showed you the picture of the well. Well, I thought if I can use remote sensing, if I can think about where these depressions are taking place. So I looked at, at DEMs from remote sensing. I use satellite-based precipitation to understand where there are rainfall patterns. I looked at materials using satellite information. I tried to quantify the different uh, fabrics or the different soils, the different um, infiltration capabilities. Uh, and then a number of other ones, I'm just showing a few. I then predicted that these black locations are where freshwater lenses could be forming. I don't know that they are, but this is a remote sensing based approach to say, this is probably happening. Okay, um, and that's what this looks like. Uh, it turns out I, 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 I thought the same thing is happening elsewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. It is, there's some known ones, there's ones that I postulated. Um, I further then said, well, if they are here, how can I use remote sensing to verify it without even drilling it? Drilling is super expensive. So I said, well, we can use thermal data because water is going to have, if something is wet versus dry, the diurnal temperature, the night to the day is going to be different. So I can do these practices of, of verification. I can look at its visible infrared, its visible and infrared uh, capabilities. Then I can do geophysics. I can run instruments on the surface to look at if the freshwater exists. And ultimately what that means is, um, you know, we, we can verify it. I, I've done physical models. I won't go through this, but I've done physical models that you can see here where I would simulate that exact technique in a laboratory. Um, and this is the dye that I've placed and you can see the freshwater that lasts. This is to get an idea of how long those lenses would exist um, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop with that. Um, and just say that um, some pictures from Indonesia and elsewhere that I, I've really enjoyed, um, you know, given this presentation, I'm, I'm really humbled by the invitation um, and I'll, I'll accept uh, any, any questions. So Tarima Kasi, thank you. Very interesting, uh, uh, this lecturing, uh, Professor Adam. Uh, we have still have uh, some question here. Maybe I will recall uh, Mbak Dewi. You can hear me? You still with us? Yes. You already raised your hand. Maybe you can deliver your question directly to Professor Adam. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, hi, uh, Prof Adam. I'm Dewi Amalia. So, uh, we usually I'm sorry so um, we at the water resources department uh, usually only use uh, satellite data without knowing the process of how the data was obtained uh, we take data from the satellite with the best uh, resolution. So, uh, is it enough if we are only choosing a satellite based on the good resolution only, or uh, do you have uh, some suggestion suggestion from us uh, what kind of satellite that we should use? I think that's all. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think. First and foremost, you're not wrong for, for choosing the best resolution. Um, where, where things could be um, 
you know, harmful or, or dangerous, so to speak, would be if it if it is believing that all the results have to be true. What I mean by this is, let's say one of them is precipitation, you know, and then you search four different satellites to find the one with the best resolution for precipitation. You know, I, I would recommend, um, there are a lot of articles, I publish a lot of articles on, on, on comparisons of, of, of parameters and, and satellite sensors. Um, and so I would recommend that, yes, um, what, what you might do is see if there are articles that say if it's precip. As an example, trim precipitation is, is great unless you're in an arid environment. If you're in an arid environment, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be good. And so um, I would then recommend a different satellite sensor. So there are times uh, where that's the case, um, but generally I, I think you're okay if you, you, know, you look for the better resolution uh, and then ultimately try to seek out, you know, if there's any published information on that. Again, you can feel free to reach out to me and I can provide if I, if I know or, or not. Okay. Maybe we move to the next, uh... Question, uh, Mas Faisal. Hello, yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you also, uh, Department uh, of Water Resources Engineering, yeah, uh, Indra Wijaya. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Prof. Adam, I would like to ask uh, two short questions actually. So, uh, yeah, uh, first again, thank you for the awesome presentation. I am learning so much. Uh, so my first question is, so yeah, I think it is, yeah, it's important to say that uh, the data science province, data science proficiency is essential in this age. So my first question is, what do you think is important for uh, uh, us, the young professionals and the students uh, to mm. learn to survive this uh, changing time? And uh, the second uh, question is, so I recognize that uh, among the satellites, there are uh, geostationary satellites and non-geostationary satellites. In relation to our field, hydrology and hydrogeology, what are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, those two different satellites? Thank you. Um, thanks, Faisal. Uh, again, it's great to see you and, 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 uh, and some of the other people from Boost. Um, I'll answer your second one first, just so I don't forget it. Uh, so the geostationary satellites are, are the ones that are, like you said, they're higher in Earth's orbit so that they can remain stationary. Um, the disadvantages are generally that they will come with a lower spatial resolution because they're higher in Earth's orbit. Um, most of those are for weather purposes, not all, but most of them. Um, so if you're tracking weather patterns and, and so forth, um, that, that's generally most of the ones that I showed, for example, in this presentation that talked about grace, and those are, are non geostationary satellites. Um, and, and their advantage is that, of course, that they can track different parts of the globe at different times um, because they're always in orbit. The disadvantage, of course, is that you can't pick when you want it to be over your area of interest, right? You can't say, well, I, I want it to be June 15th because I know it rained that day. <laughs> well, you, you know, you can't, you can't predict that because it's a, it's a non-stationary. So that, that's the advantage, disadvantage to that, um, if that makes sense. Kind of going to your first question is what is important? How can you survive? What are those 21st century skills that one needs? Uh, I, I think in a nutshell, that is, the ability, the ability to understand multi-information, multiple data sets, um, being able to integrate different processes and different sciences. I, I know that's kind of broad, um, but I, I think what's gonna be important, of course you need to know the technical skill itself. For example, you might need to know how to actually program in some language, whether that is R, uh, whether that is Java, or, or MATLAB or something, uh, Python, I think that's gonna be critical, but it's gonna be even more critical if, if one can step back from the technical aspect, the, the doing aspect and be thinking about it. You know, what does it mean when I integrate two different data sets? Really, what should I be looking for? 
I worry that what might happen as we continue to teach data science, that people become so proficient in techniques that they lose the ability to think about the process. So I would recommend that never to forget about the process, the fundamentals. You know, everybody can at one point, so to speak, learn the techniques and, and you will learn them and they'll always change. Uh, you know, a person like me in remote sensing, I joke sometimes, right? I, I joke with my colleagues in geology that some of them know knowledge about rocks that hasn't changed for 50 years. So they learned it once and they can still teach it for the last 50 years. Um, I, as there's somebody who learns remote sensing, I feel like every day I have to learn again. What I, if I were to give this presentation 10 years ago, it's totally different because we've evolved so much in terms of, of techniques and, and ability to do things. And so, so I would say the two main things is to never lose sight of the forest for the trees, as they say, and, and to make sure you're always keeping up with it, always reading, always inquiring. I think those are gonna be the skills. Is okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, great answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I, and also, I think it is also uh, you know for the first question, I'm not actually asking it for myself, but you know I am also a part of ed education institution, and also and so does Jadvan and everybody else in Rawijaya. So I think I'm also thinking about my future students uh, so why what should i teach them and i think it is also important for any uh, water related institution in indonesia so thank you very much thank you okay uh, anyone to uh, give some question for we still have maybe 5 minutes if i'm not wrong Anyone? Oh, okay. Please, you can directly ask him. Mas Putu Mongo, please. Okay, thank you for the time. <clears throat> uh, from Adam, I am Putu from Bali. Yeah, uh, I'm very impressed yeah, with your presentation about the Uh, application of remote sensing, yeah, especially in uh, geohydrology, groundwater like that. Yeah, uh, I have a question about the application of remote sensing in groundwater, uh, especially in determination of research area uh, uh, at a groundwater basin. What the indicator yeah are used in determining the groundwater recharge area using a remote sensing approach. Just that, Prof, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Puto. Um, did you, just to understand the question, were you talking about groundwater as a whole or de determining the groundwater recharge sort of specific area, or did you mean just understanding groundwater in a basin? Yeah, yeah, for the specific area. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so from a remote sensing standpoint, you know, there's two parts to it, right? Uh, you know, from thinking about a, a groundwater area or trying to determine its source area or its, its impact area, you know, that, that would be a combination, I would say, of a number of different sensors that one might consider. They might consider visible data that, that might look at, you know, topography, that might look at soil moisture, um, that might look at some radar techniques that they would look into the subsurface, very shallow subsurface. Um, and that might give us ideas of infiltration variability, which we might infer to be a recharge area. Um, the, the other way and probably maybe the more successful way if the basin is large enough would be from GRACE because GRACE will be able to see localized variations that we can then assume would show the land surface depiction of, of recharge source area, if that makes sense. Um, so, and by large enough, just to put that into a number, Grace is about 300 square kilometers. 300 kilometers. Yeah, okay. Now, um, some of the papers that I've shown, some of the machine learning techniques I will show tomorrow, 
that myself and students have been successful at, we have downscaled that data using some of these other land surface parameters all the way down to about one to five kilometers. Um, mm. Of course, there's a trade-off. There's going to be potential inaccuracies, um, but but we can now and myself and others. This is a this is a very evolving science right now with groundwater. Is how do we downscale grace? Because the stuff that we get from them is going to be 300 kilometers. So you know, even the entire island of Java is not going to be very informative. <laughs> um, but you know, if you can downscale it, then we can see not only variations, but potentially source area amount. So that's that's the other thing. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, uh, I'm now uh, currently use a uh, geographic information system combin combining with combination with isotop, yeah, for determination of the groundwater recharge in my research now. Okay, thank yeah, you, Rob Adam. That's great. Yeah, um, I mean that again. That's and that would be the best approach, right? I mean, it's the field-based approach of using GIS to understand spatial relationships connect, collected with field data. And yeah. you know, the idea would be to try to augment that, to help it with, with remote sensing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the explanation, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, the time is up, uh, Professor. Uh, I still, uh, so uh, I see, a lot of question and I'm very happy today because everyone is very enthusiastic with this uh, today and maybe I will keep, I promise I will keep the question for tomorrow maybe uh, and if uh, not uh, the time is not enough also maybe I, I uh, maybe I permit to send it uh, through email to you. If is it okay? Of course. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and again, I just want to thank uh, you, Jed Fine, from, from everybody at University of Brajaya, from the Water Resources Engineering Department, from USI at the, the chair, and, and everyone. It's it's great um, to, to see also my old boost uh, friends. And uh, I, I look forward to, to coming back tomorrow. Um, can we take a picture a moment, please? Lisa? Everyone? Uh, Maybe you can turn on your camera and we can take some picture today. Ms. Rama, can you help me to take the picture? Sure, Mr. Jafan. So everybody, one, two, three, and smile. Okay, and next slide. So today uh, we have a... Uh, 70 people now, but this is uh, only 50. So slide two, smile. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jafan. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rama. Thank you, Professor Adam, for today. And maybe we can continue tomorrow. I, I think maybe uh, the presentation and lecturing will be more interesting than today. I saw a lot of questions regarding uh, your pre presentation today. And I think tomorrow will be more interesting and more questions regarding sure. about uh, remote sensing and how the technique uh, we can uh, interpret the groundwater and hydrology cycle and what it does. Thank you for the, your uh, opportunity and thank you for uh, participant committee and uh, our head of department, Busi. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, see you tomorrow and have a nice day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Thank you Professor, Professor Adam. Adam. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you. See you all. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Stay healthy and safe, everyone. See you. See you. See you. Terima kasih, Bapak Ibu. Terima kasih. Eh, Mbak belum Novi. Tadi tidak ditutup sama Bu Rana. Oh, acara. Ya udah, Pak Jarpar udah ngatasi.